Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is where you're watching this. Uh, this is Pastor Jeff Snow from First Baptist Church in Port Hope, welcoming you to my office and our little time together as we look into God's Word and see what He can teach us about Him and about ourselves. And today we're going to look a little more about how how we relate to the world around us. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture from the Book of Acts which is often used by, by a number of um, pastors and speakers um, to kind of point to how we are to share the gospel in a world that is really post-Christian, in a world that's really unchurched and has not a lot of knowledge about who God and Jesus is compared to maybe 50 or 80 years ago. And we're going to take a look at a longer passage of scripture. Most of the time I've just been sharing one verse with you and then holding up a piece of paper with the verse on it. But we're going to try something here. Let's see if this works. All right. Um, we're going to see if we could show you. Now, hopefully you are seeing the passage of scripture we're going to look at. It's Acts chapter 17 and it's starting to read at verse 22 and going down to the end of the chapter. Take a look at it together. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. And among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus and also a woman, woman named Damaris in a number of others. I hope that worked. I hope you were able to see it and just read it. If it didn't work, uh, pause before I stop reading it, start reading it, and go and look up Acts chapter 17 and you can follow along as I'm reading it. In verse 16 of this chapter, we see Paul coming into this into Athens, into this part, this great city, and his heart went out to them. He was greatly troubled by the fact that there were just idols everywhere. The first thing that prompted Paul to share the gospel with these people was the pain that he felt at their lostness. He, he had come to know the living God in a real and powerful way. And he looked out amongst the city and he saw people worshiping idols of stone and gold and silver idols that could not hear their prayers, idols that could not build a relationship with them. And Paul knew the reality. Paul knew and longed for them to know what he experienced in the one true God. And so that's where it begins, where we allow God by his Holy Spirit to build in us an ache, build in us a sadness, build in us a a heart that goes out to those who are, are wandering spiritually, who are searching but never finding, who are lost. 
I read somewhere, pastor said, you know, things will begin to change in our view as Christians of the world around us if we begin to see people less as wrong and more as lost. Yes, they have wrong perceptions, wrong worldviews, but more than anything, people without Christ are lost. And rather than arguing with them from a point of view of their wrong, we want to be able to share with them, considering them as people who are lost, helping them to find what we have found in Christ. And so he begins to share um, with these people at the Areopagus, if I say it right. And it's not like in previous times when he shared with a Jewish crowd and he started off by talking about Jewish history and, and the synagogue and, and things that people will be familiar with. If he had done that in the Areopagus, it would have kind of gone, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's not, this is not part of my world. I have no idea. So he started with where they were. He began to talk about things that they were familiar with. And today we're living in a, a world of what is called biblical illiteracy. We're living in a world where the church in particular and the scriptures are just not on people's radar. People have a spiritual interest. They, many believe in a higher power, many even believe in God, but to fully understand who God is and to know that he is knowable and to, and to find out about Jesus Christ, um, that is on that, not on the radar of a lot of people. And, and even to come into a church and, and to know what a church does and how becoming part of a church community um, is an important part of, of being able to understand God more. It's just not on people's radar. Um, I coach a, a team at our local high school of uh, students. It's, it's called Reach for the Top or School Reach. It's basically Jeopardy. We have to ask trivia questions, general knowledge questions. They compete against teams from other schools. And we get these, these packages of questions from the head office of the organization that runs the thing. And, and so we have these practice games and, and tournaments. And I'm often a question asker. And I, I'm often, I'm kind of impressed at the number of times they'll have categories of questions on, on religion and Christianity and the Bible. Because throughout the game, there's different categories of, of questions on science and math and pop culture and music. And, and so um, oftentimes there'll be questions about religion, Christianity, the Bible. And I'm struck by how many times students will, will, will just kind of sit back put down whatever signaling device they use to, to try and answer the question and they'll just kind of sit back and fold their arms and and they, they'll just wait till that category is over and wait for the next category on hockey <laughs> because they know that they will not be able to answer any of these questions um, they're good on greek mythology and roman mythology and other things but many of them just don't have a clue and that's that's our fault our generation's fault in not teaching them, in not um, helping them understand that this is something that's important. We live in a culture of biblical illiteracy. And so if we begin with the Bible, um, people will say, well, what's the Bible? Why is that authoritative? I don't believe the Bible is authoritative. What it doesn't mean anything to me? So we need to begin where people are, and this is what Paul did. He began in the context of the people he listened to, and he, he tried to find a point of contact. And he talked about, he said, I see there's this altar in your town that, that is inscribed an altar to an unknown God. And he used that as the springboard, as the starting point. And he said, I am here to explain who this God is. And I, there's a God who can be known, and I want to tell you about him. Billy Graham, one of the most, probably the most famous evangelists of the 20th century, spoke to millions of people and taught them the message of the gospel, would say, when I preach to people and I prepare messages, I do it with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. The idea of connecting scriptures and biblical truths to the reality of what's happening today. He would often, if you ever hear any messages from years ago, he would, he would do these 
big festivals in cities and speaking stadiums. And, and he would often do some research about the town and the city that he was speaking in and make some reference to it in his sermon so that he was not just some guy who's parachuted in and doesn't know anything about what's going on or in, in that locality. Um, so the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. I heard one author talk about um, points of connection and he called them on-ramps. I live near the 401. <laughs> so when you drive the 401, you, you, you live on ramps. You're, you're going onto the 401, you're going or, or an off ramp onto into the town. Um, so when we want to share the gospel with someone else, uh, we want to look for on ramps. What is it that the person is interested in? Um, and we want to care for what that other person is interested in, not just to, not just as a means of making our message known, but truly caring. What is it that the person cares about? What is it that we can connect with? What is it that they can relate to? What is it about me that can connect with the other person so that they will be willing to hear the story of the gospel? What is it about the gospel that connects to that other person's life? Um, when I was with Youth for Christ, we used to talk about something called three-story evangelism, telling three stories. We, their story, their story, <laughs> my story, and God's story. And you begin with their story. You begin by listening. So often we, we want to share the gospel with other people and talk about Jesus with others. We think about starting with talking. What are we going to say? But often it begins with listening. In the verses before the passage we read of Paul, he walked around the town, the city, and he, he understood what was going on and got a feel for what was going on. Um, it begins with listening. It begins with showing that we care. People, with that old saying, people don't care what you know until they know you care. And so we want to begin by listening to their story and then connecting with our story. Maybe there's something in their story that relates to something we went through and we can share that and it can, a connection is built between the two of us. And then from there, we point to Jesus and we share, we share God's story. I remember uh, when speaker at a Youth for Christ conference saying, you know, we're really good at doing the listening part with young people. We're really good at connecting them to our story. Sometimes we forget the third part, <laughs> you know, and um, make that final connection to God's story in Jesus Christ and what it is about God's story that people we're talking to need to hear. Elsewhere in the passage, as Paul was going on, he said, he, he affirmed the good that he saw. He said, I see that you are religious in every way. He didn't condemn. He didn't start an argument. Yes, he didn't believe that that idol was anything to do with God. And the whole phrase, but the unknown God wasn't true. But it showed that they were searching. It showed that they were spiritually hungry. And so he wanted to affirm that. I, I can see that you're religious in every way. I can see that you're trying to understand who God is. And whether you believe it or not, God has sent me here to help you understand that even more. And so from verse 24 onward, he begins to proclaim God's story. And in doing that, as I was looking at it, I said, how could I describe that? It kind of deconstructed their beliefs. Um, they kind of believed that that God was in everything. And Paul said, well, no, God is above everything, he, but he made everything. They kind of believed that God was housed in, in shrines and, and was represented by idols. And, and Paul's like, well, no, God, God is beyond that. He is transcendent. He's not, he's not confined to houses built by human hands. He wanted to tell them that all cre humanity is created by one God. They believed that they were somehow special, that God created them special above other cultures and other peoples. And Paul wanted to tell them, no, it's not the case. In fact, all humanity was created by God, that God orders our times and existence, that though God is transcendent, though he is above everything else, he is also very, very near. He is not an unknown God. He's, he is close. He is not far off. He took, he started with their beliefs and presented his argument, but not in an argumentative way, but just began with what they believed and deconstructed it and began to show what he believed 
to be true from the Gospels. And our challenge, I think, is to, to try to understand the false assumptions that people have about God. Maybe biblical illiteracy maybe isn't the right way to look at it. Maybe it's more just a whole, a whole whack of false assumptions people have about God and Christianity and Jesus and the church. Maybe we need to understand what those false assumptions are and begin there and begin to show people um, what the truth is. To show people, to present a, a counter argument, not in an argumentative way, but to show them the truth found in God's word. In verse 28, Paul even uses one of their poems. He quotes a couple of lines from a couple of their, their poets. He, he had gotten to know the culture well enough that he was able to say back to them a couple of lines from a couple of their poets that, that, that he was able to use to, to incorporate in his argument and point to God. And, and there are times when we can try to understand the worldview that people get through pop culture. Pop culture is it's, it's a big deal. It affects people's worldview. It affects people's way of looking at things through the internet, through television, through music, through movies. And we don't have to immerse ourselves in pop culture. I'm someone, I had a discussion once with somebody who works in universities like I do, and, and we were talking about relevancy, about how many people think, well, you've got to be relevant. You've got to make the church relevant and the gospel relevant. I think relevance is a little bit overblown. You don't have to be super relevant, but you do need to be conversant. You need to understand enough about the news and about pop culture and what's going on in the world so that when people talk to you about it, you're not like a deer in headlights. You at least have a bit of a basic understanding of where they're coming from and why they hold the worldview that they do. And then we can take those aspects of pop culture, maybe, and maybe we can use them in our discussion to point people to Jesus. It's not about changing the message, and that's the challenge. The gospel is the gospel, and it must never be changed, but the way we deliver it, the way we explain it in a way that people can understand and relate to, that is very important, because if we speak in a different, basically a different language, we may have shared the gospel, but it's not been received. In my years of working with young people, the question I always have to ask myself is, how do you explain the gospel in a language that young people can understand today while still staying true to the gospel? The Bible in the newspaper, the Bible in pop culture, being able to explain things in a relatable way but still staying true to the gospel. That's our challenge as Christians. Then in verse 29 and onward, Paul gives the message. He says, we are God's offspring. We are created by God, created by God for a purpose, and he loves us. Just like any parent would, that feeling that a parent has for the child. Um, I spent years as a youth pastor, I still work with young people, and many of them have come, become really close to my heart in very special ways. But there's still that piece missing if I'm not their parent. You know, there's a love that you, as a parent that you have for your child that is just beyond anything else. And we are God's offspring. And with the love that he has for us, it is just incredible. And we are called to seek the reality of God and his purpose for us. And Paul says that to them, it's not found in gold or silver or stone. Just like today, the reality of God and why he's created us is not found in money or our career or our amusements. We find God... Paul says when we repent. He didn't, didn't sugarcoat that part. He says we need to repent. And repent means, again, people have false assumptions what repent means. Repent means you're going one way. <laughs> I do puppets, so this is the puppet. You're going one way, and then you decide you're going to go the other way. You repent. It's doing a 180. You've lived your life one way, and then you confronted with the reality of God through Jesus Christ, and you decide, I'm going to live life God's way. And that's the essence of, of, of the gospel. And that repentance leads to an understanding of forgiveness, asking God to forgive us, to, to forgive us for going our own way and doing things our way. And saying, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. 
And because of what Jesus has done on the cross, and because, as Paul says in this passage, he has risen from the dead, we have that forgiveness. And because Christ lives, we too shall live in the way that God wants us to live. Verse, um, verse 2032, I think it was, um, we see the response of these people who are hearing this really for the very first time. And some of them, it says, were really turned off, especially the part about someone rising from the dead. That just was like, they didn't want to hear anymore. And that's what happens sometimes. No matter how much we try to relate and how much we try to connect and, and how much we don't argue or condemn and, and present the gospel in a loving way, there are still people who are they're just not ready. And they're going to be turned off by that part of the gospel that says, you got to stop living life your own way and you've got to start living life God's way. And that's going to happen. Other people in this response to Paul's message um, said, tell me more. I want to hear more. And there are people who will respond to the message of the gospel, not by turning it aside, but also not by receiving it, but they'll, they'll come back and they'll want to hear more. And, and that's where if we share the truth of Jesus with others, it, it can't be a one-time thing. It can't be just, well, here it is. Okay, I'll move on to the next person. The gospel is best shared in relationship. And so when you help talk to people about your faith and, and they say, hey, I think I want to hear more about this, then you walk with them. You live with their story and you find out more about their story and you listen some more. And you, you find more of those on-ramps of connection and you you respond to the, their curiosity of, of wanting to hear more. And then the scripture says that a few actually believe. Just find something considering the fact that everyone there was totally oblivious to the, the message of Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit worked in the hearts of a few, and a few believe. It was very hard ground there. Paul was talking to a bunch of people who knew nothing about what he was talking about. And 21st century North America in a lot of areas of our society are, are kind of like that. We live, sociologists will tell us, in a post-Christian world. But this passage from Acts, the, the story of Paul talking to these folks at the Areopagus, gives us a bit of a, a guideline, of a, a template, of how we can engage those around us with the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we make the effort to listen, and by listening, show that we care. We're not just the yeah, project. We're not just here because we want to share our message, what we do, but we want to hear their story. We want to know what it is that they're facing in their life. What's the, the reality of their lives? As we begin to make the effort to listen, as we begin to make the effort to, to begin our, our discussions where people are instead of where we are, begin with the things that they care about. As we make the effort to find the on-ramps, what are the ways that I can connect people with what I've experienced, with my story, listen to their story, connect with my story, and connect with God's story? As we make the effort to explain the gospel in a language people will understand, there are times when the church answers questions that no one's asking. There are times when the church speaks a language that no one's speaking. And we have to be able to find ways to stay true to the gospel, but to share it in a language that people will understand. As we make the effort to keep the message of the gospel, like I just said, keep it true. It's a powerful message. And if we water it down to make it more palatable, it's not going to have that same power. We want to make it understood, but we want the message of the gospel to come through. And as we do that, as we make all those efforts to do that with our friends and family and society around us, the Holy Spirit will begin to work in the lives of others. And there will be some, some who will believe and will come to know the reality of God, know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, to come to understand that they were created for a purpose by God and come to understand that purpose for their lives. And begin to live lives that are changed. Lord, thank you for 
privilege that you give us to, um, to share who you are with others. The minute we as Christians accepted you as Lord, you could have just taken us off the earth like this, like that, and, and to go to be with you, but you've left us here for a purpose, and that is to share who you are with others. So help us, Lord, to listen. Help us, Lord, to understand where people are coming from. Begin where they are. To understand their worldview. Be able to connect with it. Connect with their story. To share our own experiences in life. To share our own experiences with you. Help us, Lord, to gain a good understanding of the gospel so that we can explain it clearly in a language that others around us will understand. And I pray, Lord, that amidst the people who will, will reject this entirely, and amidst the people, Lord, help us to, to keep praying for those who will reject this entirely and reject you. And there will be those who will want to say, tell me more, and help us, Lord, to have patience to walk with people, even if it means years until they come to know you. And there will be some who will believe. And help us, Lord, to be able to, to water those seeds of faith and to walk alongside people that they will become more like you and grow to know you more. Lord, help us our, as Christians in our daily lives to make sharing who you are with others in ways that others will understand an important part of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I think this was a little longer than some of my others. So I'm just going to go. <laughs> We'll talk to you again next week. God bless you. Have a great week.